Hey, I'm Dagny. Let's talk about how economic oppression is utilized to keep black people in their place. I know it's a very fun and lighthearted topic, but I just feel the need to shed some light on it to further the discussion on how Africa and its diaspora need to continue to heal the distance between it. And this does link to my previous video, which I'll talk more about at the end of this video. Now, for Black people who are either not from or do not live in America or Ghana, please do not feel as if you are isolated or excluded from this conversation. I think the information is just as beneficial to you. I chose these two places because I'm able to frame them in a way that goes beyond what you can find online, if that makes sense. The economic oppression that Black people in America have experienced and continue to experience has two layers to it, which are known as a wealth gap and an income gap, where the exploitation of free labor through slavery and the passing down of the profits of that exploitation is where the wealth gap uh, comes in. The income gap adds another layer to that through occupational segregation, where there is a discrepancy on how much black people get paid. I, a lot of people are, are bringing up or trying to bring more awareness now to the Tulsa massacre and the Rosewood massacre. I want to link this economic oppression to police brutality. Police brutality is like, is like the tip of the iceberg of the issue because historically speaking, the police have been utilized in America as a weapon to maintain the status quo and keep black people in their place. Tulsa massacre, it happened in 1921. And in Tulsa, Oklahoma, there was a business district called the Greenwood District, which is also known as Black Wall Street. It covered about 35 city blocks full of black owned businesses and a variety of industries and a affluent black residential community. White mob slash KKK function proceeds to completely destroy the entire district and leave almost 10,000 black Americans homeless and kill about 300 black Americans. The first time black people really did pick themselves up off their bootstraps that nobody gave them to make something of themselves and it was completely destroyed over an alleged rumor that a white woman was offended by a black man. Keep that in mind. Now switching to Rosewood massacre, which happened in 1923. And that was in Florida. Now keep in mind again, that is instigated, that all of that destruction and blood is instigated by a rumor that a white woman was offended by a black man. Fast forward to 2020 in Central Park in New York, when a white lady is threatening to do the exact same thing, to allege that a black man is offending her knowing full well what will happen to that black man. See how police brutality, again, regardless if you're in uniform or not, is utilized to keep black people in their place. And that place is instigated by economic oppression. Black people are in the hood because you maintain them in there. Not saying there's anything wrong with the hood. But when we're talking about economic oppression as in the fact that you keep them in a hood and then insist that you need to have more police there because you know it's the hood. When it's not black people pushing drugs in the hood, it's not black people insisting they don't want a grocery store in the hood, it's not black people who is insisting they want gun violence in the hood, right? Now let's talk about the additional layer of the income gap. Percentage wise, black Americans are the second largest group of people in America who are living below this poverty threshold. Black Americans stand at 20.8% in 2018. Who is the largest group of people living underneath the poverty threshold, do you ask? Native Americans, which is a whole other conversation. Like, yes, black people got the shorter end of the stick in America. Native Americans didn't get a stick at all. And they don't have anywhere to flee to or go away to or not, like nothing. Even like doctors with no borders had to come to help them with the pandemic because the reservations are separate from America. So 
you know, it's not like there's any resources that could help, you know. That's a whole other conversation and we're not gonna get into that in this video. 8.9 million black people in America are below the poverty threshold. Then we gotta look at unemployment because again, nobody chooses to be poor. The income gap speaks to what black people in America or black America would speak to of how the, the goalpost is always moving away from where it was initially, where it's like, regardless of what you do, there's no way to catch up or fill the gap by just following the rules, by getting the education, by trying to keep a job and things like that. And that links to police brutality because police departments historically and now have always in America been utilized to maintain that status quo. If more people knew that police departments initially were created as were people who captured runaway slaves and took them back to the plantation. And then later, fast forward some decades, were unionized to further fight against the war on drugs or the war on hoods or the war on poverty. It's not shocking the police departments have evolved or not evolved in the way that it, they have. The systematicness of this inequality that Black Americans have been experiencing all their lives in America runs really deep in the foundation of America. It doesn't mean that it is pointless to ask for it to change, but it does mean that the work really needs to now be done by everybody else because Black America has been doing the work. So adding this context to the conversation of healing the gap or healing the distance between Africa and its diaspora, the issue is really not that simple. And to really understand that the struggle is not only the fact that somebody said they didn't like me because of the color of my skin. That is a very diluted, I feel that's a very diluted version of what, what has been going on and what needs to change. There is economic oppression in Ghana as well. What is the data on that? What's the history behind it? I have to sift through so many reports by NGOs, multinational corporations, and institutions that are not really of the people who they're talking about because you have pages and pages and pages of these reports by the World Bank, Oxfam, the UN, etc., they, they have all these graphs and conclude that, well, you know, this is how, you know, Ghana's not going to progress in any shape or form if they don't do X, Y, Z to the third power. Which is funny because part of their problem is that they're still in debt with you who are writing these reports. A lot of these reports give this notion that there is, you know, this elite of 10% of Ghana's population that consumes the majority of everything, including resources and income. And everyone else has just, you know, left their kike, just left there like that. These numbers do not illustrate the cost of living in Ghana. The fact that that amount, the percentage of how many are living underneath the threshold doesn't mean that that's the amount of people who are living on the street. There is the work done to analyze how economic oppression in America against black people is systematic and deliberate. And there is like a bigger agenda involved with that. Economic oppression in Ghana, is it all truly systematic? Even though it's not the British telling you to pay Ghanaians one way and pay your expats another way. Being colonized by the British, you are attached to a very different chokehold than those who were colonized by the French. How are people influencing to maintain the status quo of economic oppression? In America, within the black community, you have, sure, the poverty level that has numbers, right? You have a middle class which can range in terms of how comfortable they are in their lifestyle. And then you do have the elite. They all view each other differently. And the way in which they treat each other 
illustrates how they're not on the same team. You know, Black America is going back and forth of like, oh my gosh, hashtag Vogue challenge. And then, oh my goodness, no, this is completely against the movement. How dare you? Why are you playing to the white gaze? Or I did not get a PhD to get killed by the police. Or, you know, don't shoot, I'm a doctor. Or don't shoot, I'm a lawyer, you know? And, and then you have other black folks being like, nah, fam, black lives matter because we all matter. Like we're all worthy of not being killed regardless of your bank account or your title or your degree or anything like that. It, I think it illustrates in itself that black people are not monotone. We're not one uniform entity. Would we say we all have the exact same priorities in our mind right now? No, have we ever? No. And I trust that this time around, because we're calling it out, we can be more strategic in how we utilize it. Because I think all three groups are helpful and beneficial. If they directed their energy and their resources and their presence in a way that uplifted, as opposed to point, take down, insist one is suffering more than the other, etc. Missing each other or missing the message thing historically does influence this economic oppression against black people. Some portion of the middle class and some portion of the black elite, their relation to whiteness is where their success comes from. While you have another portion who was like, no, I didn't forget where I come from. That's why my money built that school and bailed this person out and did this, that, the other. The shift that I feel is happening in America for Black America is not only, yo, we need to speak out on everybody who doesn't look like us to understand that y'all need to do the work now, but it's also to speak out to understand, yo, there's a lot of, there is healing and conversations that are happening or need to also continue to be happening within the Black community. So in Ghana, I was also observing in real time as well as trying to take note of what, if anything has been written on, about is there that, that concept of within the population, not just who did the government sell itself to, where did those Airbuses come from? Like not just at that level, but on a people level, on a community level in Ghana. You have your poverty level, right? You got your middle class level, which really is within the last decade-ish was developed due to money coming in from discovery of oil and things like that. And then you also have the elite, which I, I don't think one would call bougie. I'm not sure what you would call them. Y'all let me know in Ghana, what do you call your elite? Do you have a slang term for them? Let me know. Now, I would like to think that portions of the middle class and the elite are very aware of all the unnecessary suffering happening in their country and make real effort that is effective to make some tangible difference. Now, there's also another portion of middle class and elite who give off the impression that it's not their problem. And it is because of them that there are nice restaurants to go to and better and better quality hotels to hang out at and more expensive stores to shop at, maybe. But none of that really trickles down to making an impact on the gaps and discrepancy. So do you see the link that economic oppression is being utilized both in Ghana and America to keep black people in a certain place, to deprive black people of certain resources and experiences and success? How can we learn from that and not repeat it among our own people? I just feel this is such a golden opportunity for the entire world to get it right this time. How do we learn from how economic oppression has been utilized against us? How do we learn from it so we can actually protect our own and protect what we build? Because I feel like that is how we always get the shorter end of the stick. Because we've been done dirty for so long, we are still debating on who suffered more or who suffered less or whose struggle holds more value, which I feel like deprives us from 
getting to the point of, okay, so how are we gonna make sure that protect our own so that when we do make moves strategically to do better for our own people, it is not destroyed by those who prefer to maintain the status quo under economic oppression, under the guise of that's just the way things have been. What do y'all think about that? Because that is, that is the reason why people bring up Tulsa and Rosewood, to give you the red, you know, the red alert that it's not as simple as just go do your own thing. We can't because it always gets destroyed. Well, why don't you catch up? Because you keep on beating me up every time I try to move away from where you, you, you left me. And historically for Africa, any leader who tried to move and maneuver in a way that really was for its own people and really was like, I don't care about these external forces who think that because they colonized all of this and put the borders themselves that they have, they are entitled to whatever they want. They always end up being murdered. They're called the dictator. They're called a communist. They're called a murderer. They're called crazy, right? So that nobody will come to their rescue when it's time to murder them. I feel this is such, this is such a golden opportunity for the entire planet. And it is such a golden opportunity for Africa and all of its people, regardless if it's in Africa, regardless if they're in Africa or not. And I, and I, I want to see us win. But in order to do that, we can't be complacent with the status quo. We can't just sit down comfortable because that's how it's always been. So what are we supposed to do? Before I close out this video, I want to say thank you all so much for your response in my previous video about whether discussing whether Africa and the world are an ally to Black Lives Matter. Y'all made my day. I was like, oh my God, y'all actually commented. You were writing full paragraphs. I was like, what? They can hear me? That was so cool. So uh, thank you so much. And I did, I hope I did, try to uh, respond to each and every one of you. Thank you to those of you who took the time to go to my website and actually read the post. Uh, I appreciate it. And I do hope that you now understand that when I close out each video and I remind you to go to my website, I'm not just talking. I actually did develop a whole post to go with the video because I can't say everything in the video because then the video will be two hours, 36 minutes and 16 seconds long. And ain't nobody got time for that. So like the amount of time I take doing the video is almost three times that amount of time to do the blog post. So like there's gems there for you if you if you take the time and just like go look at it, yeah? Yeah? So thank you, thank you for that. Thank you for those of you who remained respectful while commenting. Let's maintain that, shall we? Yes. And I'm excited for us. I'm so excited for us to continue the conversation. Uh, but understand that for me, I'm not interested in just like talking for talking sake. Uh, I, I want, I feel like if if to start, we got to have these conversations, awesome. But the goal is that it's it's leading to something tangible that really makes a difference. I feel like Africa cannot afford to pretend as if it's isolated from the rest of the world. There's there's more to it because like I, I expressed in this video is that this is not just about there's something happening far away over there in America and you know, it's not good. And well, y'all can always come to Africa, so. And I'll just continue what I'm doing with my life right now. You know, like it doesn't, it doesn't work that way. The reason why the spark has occurred in America is to get everyone else in the world to also look at yourself and be like, you know what? Other countries have police brutality issues. We'll get on it and get it together. What policies need to be changed? In every African country, what policies need to be changed? Where does funding need to rightfully be placed? When are we going to hold politicians accountable? When are we going to hold church leaders accountable? When are we going to hold our neighbors accountable? Do you, do you see? That, it, that is where this is going. Now, since that post, the funeral service that occurred in Houston, and they did acknowledge Ghana in it due to the tribute that they made, which is wonderful. That's lovely, good job. And, and I think this is progress so we can learn how to bet, do better with signaling and timing, which goes with the notion of what I'm trying to help us fight against, is that we cannot pretend that we're isolated. 
We cannot pretend that because something's happening way over there, we can just take our time with everything because, you know, we don't have to go at the same pace as everybody else. Cert certain things, you could pick up some speed, especially if it doesn't cost much to do. We got, we got to do more with this opportunity, you know? So I am encouraged. I've seen some Ghanaian content creators. I've seen some of them step up and speak out. At the moment, I'm seeing more people speaking out about sexual harassment. Of course, the majority of them are women. That is a big deal. Before all of this, the constant marches and demonstrations and presentations and initiatives and programs and schools and all of that, all primarily spearheaded by women in Africa about sexual harassment, sexual violence, and the, really the mistreatment of women in Africa. All right, that is a big, big deal. And I am encouraged to see more voices stepping out of their comfort zone to speak up on that. In Liberia, who are not only speaking up on their own platform, but even convening like-minded people to amplify the message even more of how you really can no longer pretend to be disconnected or distant. And what does that mean as you're pushing forward of what needs to be fixed on the ground? And what does that mean for the healing of the distance between Africa and its diaspora? Like, it's awesome. And that's the kind of, that's the kind of response I'm talking about when I'm asking Africa, what are you doing? That, that's what I'm talking about. You got you got to run with it. It's 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 not enough to just acknowledge it's sad that that's happening and then just continue with your life as is the, and just continue with the status quo as is. There's stuff right there where you are that need to change, that need to evolve, that need to transform, that need to heal. Because if you don't, don't don't allow the pain and struggle that's happening in America to 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 go to waste. Black people all over the planet, I'm looking at you too. Sure, start with conversation, but then it pushes to real tangible change. That's that's the point. Let's continue the conversation. And I spoke about a few things in the video. You wanna, you know, evolve. You wanna respond, dive into those concepts. If you even have even more information to contribute to economic oppression happening to black people and how we can learn from it, right? It's not enough to be like, yes, it has happened and let's list all these historical factors as to how it's happening. How do we learn from it and level up from it? We need to do our part too, because if the external forces finally are like, okay, 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 due to the pandemic and the hornets and whatever else, we are finally like, we're done, we get it, we're done, okay, here you go, what do you want? We, we gotta have the answer or then they'll just get comfortable again, pulling your puppet strings. My question for you, comment below and tell me, it's a two part question. What is one thing you would like to know or learn more about or are confused about when it comes to the black American experience or this particular movement that is continuing to become bigger than it's ever been? And two, what do you wish Black America knew or understood about you? And that can be personally you as an African in terms of what you feel you stand for, or you as in what you feel your country or your culture stands for, or represents, or can even offer or brings to the table, yes? If you are some identifies as being Black American or being Black outside of Africa, what is it that you wish Africa knew and understood about you. And again, it's either you personally, your culture, where you're from, or what you have had to experience being outside of Africa. Make sure you go to my website, dagnizenovia.com, where you will find the blog post for this video, where I will go further in the historical factors of economic oppression, as well as give you resources for those history buffs, give you resources and where you can dive even further in those topics. I also will again, which I think I'll do for every blog post now, continue curating black content 
and black businesses for you to continue to support. Because again, this was never a moment. This was always a movement. So we got to keep it going even after it's no longer trendy. Yes. For me, this, this actual engagement, the actual conversations, the you're learning from me and I'm learning from you, that, that's where real community is. That's where real differences are made. That's where real evolution and transformation occurs. That's, I mean, not saying we're gonna organize a revolution in public like this, but I'm just saying. Thank you so much for watching. Be safe. I'll see you next time.